problems. But let, let's start because it's um, a real pleasure um, to welcome you going to, to our series of RSC webinars. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome everybody in the in the audience. I'll explain a little bit about how these webinars work for those of you who haven't been before. But let me first welcome uh, Gwen Laurie, who's associate professor of uh, um, chemistry in the University of Queensland. Um, Gwen is interested in a lot of things about chemistry learning and teaching, but particularly about conceptual understanding and looking at conceptual understanding and how that can be promoted through various aspects of feedback and looking at student self-regulation and lots of things. So you'll, you'll see from her presentation the diversity of things she's interested in. Uh, she's a very well-noted educator, um, so she's won lots of awards. Um, she won the 2013 Pearson or ACI Award for the Australian Chemical Institute. And in 2018, she was awarded the Chemical Education Division Award from the ORACI as well. So she's, oops, there we go. And we're back. Okay, fire alarm done. Um, that was my cue to stop talking, Gwen, but I'll just tell the audience, first of all, the, the way these um, webinars work is um, you're able to enter in commentary and text through the chat button. So in the bottom right hand corner of your screen, you'll see a purple arrow and across there'll be uh, the fourth, first icon from the left will be a chat icon. So if you click on that, you can just type in there. I, I typed in something now. Um, and here you'll be able to ask questions or comments as you think of them um, as the webinar is going on. And then we'll stop midway through the webinar and at the end, and I'll pass those questions on to Gwen and that'll be how we'll facilitate discussion. But I've talked for far too long, so Gwen, thank you very much. We're really excited to hear your talk, and I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Michael. Thank you for the invitation, and thanks everyone for, for coming and joining in. Um, so let's just share some of the things that we've been doing in the last couple of years uh, here in, at UQ in Australia. So um, my, the title of my talk is kind of really focusing where we're at at the moment. We're faced with new challenges, and. Uh, I think it's it's common from talking to people uh, the last couple of years, we're all sort of faced with these new ideas of working with blended learning environments. Um, and that, that's that transition from going where we have the teacher in the classroom with the students, um, that's synchronous, so everything's happening in that space, um, to the other extreme where we saw the MOOCs arise and people were learning on their own, basically, in a self-directed way. Um, we're, we're trying to find some balance between those and um, at UQ in particular, the uh, idea of blended learning and active learning classrooms is uh, a very strong and strategic um, as part of the uh, giving students flexibility in their learning. So um, when we started to really think about this, one of the things that guide us when we're doing our teaching practice and the way I'm going to present this is to kind of allude to the fact that we have this um, chicken and egg thing going on in terms of doing research that informs teaching practice, but also um, finding things that we, in practice that then feed back into research and in questions that arise. And something that's really important to us is being inclusive in our practice. So we have um, a very specific challenge in Australia in terms of our context. So what I talk about is really um, Placed in Australia, the diversity of the students that we have, their prior experiences and high school experiences. Um, but we also, as a tertiary institution, have a challenge in scale. So um, you can see there that there's students come from all over into classrooms, but we're very much interested in making sure every single student can access the learning, particularly in, the, in, in blended environments, um, which is the challenge as we see it. Uh, so when we start to think about um, designing the either the course level or the curriculum level, and we're trying to build in more active learning that's supported through technology and more uh, students independent learning or self-regulated learning uh, that, that engages in, in deeper learning, um, we have to start pushing our boundaries. And uh, this is a representation that I use to uh, show some of those ideas. Um, I'm not going to go into TPAC um, if anyone's interested. Um, that's technological pedagogical content knowledge. Uh, that's still a, an evolving area and there's the theories there that um, help identify the, the various factors. Um, I'm just going to anchor this into what we do as teachers and our awareness of the needs of our students 
um, and also our own skills as well as their skills in working in whatever learning environment we, we bring ourselves together in. So um, there's a balance between um, different types of uh, digital literacies and technological skills and also the different learning environments that we have students in. And one of the fundamental questions is, is you know, how do we know students are learning and what we create? And that's really the focus of a lot of research we're doing at the moment. So this is um, a second consideration, and it probably gets to the core of the, the, the various theories and frameworks that we bring into thinking about what happens in the uh, blended learning classroom. Uh, what, what you gather there is resources, and what teachers tend to do is uh, something that's informed by variation theory. We, we bring together things that we feel um, will construct learning with students, um, that, they, that we can get feedback and we can share our ways of knowing and thinking. So the, the space of the learning space, whether it's in a classroom and face to face, or whether it's, um, it's the uh, digital space, um, we, we're putting lots of different forms of representation there, and these particular lists of representations here come from various um, theories. So what I'm trying to get at is that as a teacher, we have an idea of what we want students to encounter, the representations we bring to the students, and the conceptions that we're hoping to support with those. And then as a student, we're bringing prior experiences and their own uh, representational competences into that. So it, the learning space then is a shared environment, and those, it's informed by the internal mental models as such of both the teacher and the students that are placed there. So there's two ways of thinking about this in terms of the theoretical frameworks. There's the cognitive processing side of things, what, what the brain can handle and how it evolves over time through learning and what it's encountering. But there's also the way the teachers present things to students, so the disciplinary pedagogies and practices. And I'm going to refer to that um, throughout the um, throughout my talk today. So <clears throat> I'm just going to start um, by talking about the big picture. So that's the practice-driven piece. We want students to be involved in these rich, active learning experiences. Um, and to do that, we have to design things very carefully. And there's a lot of literature about how to go about that. So um, we very much are informed by that. We bring together different elements, and particularly things like scaffolding and using diagnostics and formative feedback. Um, and we're also conscious of the array of different um, disciplinary representations that can be used. And I've referred to a few different um, lenses or perspectives on that, so that, um, including Gilbert's um, mo modes of think, um, representation, Ainsworth's functions of representations when they're combined, and Johnston's levels of chemistry thinking. So all of those come into play when we're, we're putting things together. So we follow a very careful design process, and we've been doing this since about 2009. And um, we um, use backwards design, but we also apply design-based research. And that gives us the freedom to actually do a very strong evaluation of any changes that we make in our classrooms or our courses. Backwards design, I'm sure most people are familiar with. So we start with thinking about what the learning outcome should be. So in a blended learning environment, what is it we want students to be able to, to leave that environment with? Um, and then how, we, how do we measure that? And then what do we get them to do to be able to achieve it? Um, the design-based research um, part of things is, is actually where we um, use a very strong evaluative framework. Um, and we, it gives us this very um, grounded way of collecting data that answers the research questions around the learning environment, learning process, and the learning outcomes for students. So uh, just to everything that we do um, follows that sort of um, foundation. And um, just to give you insight into um, the sorts of uh, ways that we start, we draw on research. Uh, we use what's known out there across different um, bodies of uh, literature and research. and then we bring it together into our context and discipline. So we talk, we, the, the ones in particular that we um, have used to, for blended learning environments is we look at whether the, um, the situation is teacher guided. So is it um, in an active learning classroom where the teacher's present um, and the, the instructions or the activities are very um, well informed and also prompted through the teacher? Or is it something the students are doing um, 
for example, in a flipped environment where they're having to work on their own and they're more autonomous because that requires different types of scaffolding. And then what do we put in front of the students? Is it a two-dimensional worksheet? Is it an interactive three-dimensional dynamic simulation? All of those have different uh, impact in terms of the way that students work with them, especially based on their prior experiences in chemistry. Uh, and we have to be conscious of minimizing cognitive overload. And then if we embed formative feedback, and I'll, I'll try and hopefully convince you that that's uh, something that's really critical in blended learning environments um, to keep students working um, and in a, in a, a curious way. So somebody just drew on it. <laughs> um, okay. So the evaluation, as I mentioned before, is, is basically the interplay between the environment that we've created, um, how we've encouraged students to learn, so the process that they engage with through what we've put together in the environment, and then measuring their learning outcomes. And uh, Carmel McNaught has been a critical friend um, for us for several years. She's an Australian um, evaluator and worked with Rob Phillips and Gregor Kennedy. So um, that framework has helped us uh, immensely in capturing all different types of data. And, and I'm, again, happy to talk to people afterwards if they're interested in knowing more about that and how you can build that into a framework for collecting and then answering research question, uh, data to answer research questions. It's very useful. So just to give you the idea of how we go about um, putting together online self-regulated modules. Um, these are used in either post-class or pre so they're flipped um, or in preparing students to address high school concepts or there for reinforcing concept, concepts after the, um, they, they've been through a lecture or, or other face-to-face -face contact session. They can be used in contact sessions as well. Um, the piece that I'm going to focus on today is really the piece in the middle, which is step two. We've, we've done a lot of work around using diagnostic concept questions um, and trying to give the students feedback on their thinking before they even start the activities. And our early work was very simple. It was a test with feedback which was differentiated and pointed students to specific activities. And they were interactive. They were based in the web. There were things like FET or molecular workbench modules and um, other types of video simulations and discussions. So then they would, um, when they felt that their students, when they felt they um, filled in gaps, they would then go, go towards doing a quiz, um, which was based on lecture content. So uh, that was very, very successful. The students really appreciated um, working through that um, routinely. So every week there was one of these modules and we had very strong feedback that that's something that they felt taught them to work with more independently. So that was, that was a very simplistic way. But what we found is um, that we could do it in a more intelligent way in terms of the type of scaffolding, the nature of the questions and the prompts that we asked and the nature of the representations. We found that students um, their li digital literacy to some extent prevented them from accessing some things and their um, interpretation or ability to um, probe or explore quite openly through things um, was quite low at times. So um, as part of um, his PhD research, we had um, Mamoun uh, actually looked into designing a study where we could explore what motivated students to engage, um, what sort of structural scaffolding they needed um, and how their chemistry thinking as such. So this isn't just a talk about um, online learning per se, it's, it's digging down into the chemistry concepts and what is it that we put in front of students that help them start to test their thinking and address any flaws or um, confirm and challenge themselves in thinking as well. So the early uh, form of our modules, and I still use these modules uh, uh, since 2014, this, they're running at the moment in this semester, uh, still successfully, um, but now on, on a different platform. So I've gone from the LMS onto edX Edge, which is another challenge for teachers as, as technology changes and the platforms change, everything has to change. Um, but the, the way we worked it was that we thought very carefully about what, how to prompt students, what, how do we get them to, um, to, to actually spend time check what they're thinking and act upon that. So um, we 
we can, oh, sorry, I'll just backtrack a second here with this one. One of the things you can do in the landscape view of the whole class as they move through these things is get analytics. And that's actually quite interesting in itself, but it doesn't give you individual information about what the students are thinking or doing. It gives you patterns of behavior and you can start to, to change how you um, flow the students through things. So here's an example of using Google Analytics to, to get the idea of the students progress between different web pages um, it's quite fun and, and um, I had a student um, Lily Walsh who, who generated heaps of these diagrams so looking at where students went in web, the websites and modules um, based on the feedback they got from the concept questions um, and and the pattern wasn't as detailed or intricate as we might have hoped we saw that um, basically they they would be triggered to go to the website, but then they just click progressively from left to right across the tabs on the web page rather than specifically addressing uh, the, the concept or the question they might have got wrong. It, all except for one question on this particular module, which was interesting. So, so substance is dissolving um, uh, to um, low concentration ionic salts and asking what species would be present in the, was the, the nature of the question. Uh, what we found is that actually that was one that triggered some exploration around the tabs in different orders as they sought to try and understand things a little bit more. And the, these were followed up with um, like in, interviews as well to sort of con confirm what we were seeing in terms of the flow. Um, but as I said, it's very um, blunt information in terms of individual student thinking more about the whole cohort. And we're talking about class sizes here of um, 1,100 students. So uh, when we asked students about this um, process, lots of things they said to us was that they, they found that the feedback they got was, was vague or it was tedious. It wasn't very personalized. Um, they found trying to persist with things were quite difficult. So there was this element of there was something extra needed to engage them with thinking about the chemistry concepts. Um, and as I said, that's where the Moon's project um, came into effect. Now, what we were conscious of from the, the uh, initial work exploring the effectiveness of the instructional design was that students told us that um, they really wanted somebody to explain to them what to do or what they were observing. Most of the resources, including um, videos of how to use FET modules, were, had pop-ups and text-based instructions. Um, and, and this came back to the idea of, of some um, Richard Mayer's work in, in terms of students needing to have um, very carefully organized information. So uh, both um, words and pictures, and it's called the cognitive theory of multimedia learning. So when we're starting to do things online, and perhaps when they're working on their own, or even if they're working with others in classrooms, that there needs to be a strategic arrangement of the information. And so the dual channel is the um, text or words coming through um, the pictures and things, the eyes, or oral or verbal, um, explanations uh, being heard uh, to help link things together. So as you can see, this works in the uh, broadly in, in terms of that cognitive load. So if there's too many things on one page, students become overwhelmed. If it, it's not clear how representations are linking together, they um, also are unable to make the connections. And this is things that we've observed. So what we did was um, start to be a little bit more careful in thinking. What, what if we develop a sequence of uh, activities in a module uh, without teacher guidance? So this is for that blended environment where students are preparing perhaps to come to class and work on things in class discussions and so on, but they need to address things before they arrive or you want them to encounter a concept or refresh ideas that they've brought from high school. And so Mamun, he uh, worked quite hard to develop modules um, that built on the really well-known predict, observe, explain framework. However, he extended it in terms of using formative feedback to add an evaluate phase to get students to think about their own thinking uh, once they'd had some feedback. So um, this was quite successful um, in terms of giving us insight into how students engage with these online activities. And, and then it, it started to dig down more into the representational focus um, that we have an interest in. And so the combination of, of the activities 
Um, so students were asked to predict what they might observe and then engage with one of the simulations or a video um, to check whether their thinking would be correct. And they then were then perhaps um, given prompt or asked questions to explain a little bit more deeply about what they were thinking um, and some feedback about their thinking, whether it's correct or wrong, and then to reflect on their thinking. So it was much more scaffolded in, in different ways. We also trialed very open uh, modules where there was just general feedback um, or a what we call a cognitive conflict question, where they had to try and explain their thinking by open exploration of whatever representations were with, on the pages in front of them. And he um, looked at the way that students um, engaged with these modules through three ways. He observed them. Um, all of our work has ethics um, approval from the institution. Uh, he looked at their interaction by recording using screen capture how they interacted with the modules and then he interviewed them afterwards showing them what they've done and, and then they, they actually explained their thinking a little bit more in that, that um, interview situation. Um, so it, it became evident that actually their level of prior chemistry had a significant impact on their ability to explore um, independently uh, the way that they thought or to respond to questions. So that they, their confidence was also an issue in, those, in, in these modules. Now, so obviously if we've got a thousand students and we want them to work through some sort of blended learning activity uh, that's highly representational, we need to understand, well, what triggers them to actually invest in thinking more deeply about that? So um, some of the things that were observed then, um, just as a just summary, is this is PhD thesis, there's an awful lot more than this, but some of the key things. Um, he found that, that that whole idea of the um, multimedia and cognitive load, uh, students um, were much more comfortable sitting watching the videos. So it was passive learning and it's got a lower cognitive load really when, when they're being explained. Um, they were less um, willing to engage in the simulations, which simulations which required that active learning and there was much more thinking about the intention of, of how they interacted with those. And there's an example student comment there, the video was helpful to me because at the end he can explain clearly the reason behind it. I prefer the video over the simulation because it explains things in a very short way. From the video I learn more because the person in the video discusses more details on the theory and the concept. So that human explanation um, was what was favoured. So students also, um, when they were interviewed, expressed a preference for the strongly guided so that the, the modules where they were really scaffolded with prompts or queries and um, or concept checks, and they preferred that in, to being just left to explore. Uh, so example there, a simulation was very hard or pretty hard to understand because I had to play around things myself. And it would be better if there's somebody actually voicing over or actually explaining it to you. Again, that, that sort of desire to have some more uh, directed way or somebody explaining what to notice, what features to notice and what to do in the uh, simulations. That was quite common. Uh, the other thing was that we did find that the feedback synchronously. So uh, as they're working through the module, and um, once they click on something, to get immediate feedback was very important to the students. It's not something we automatically build into online learning activities when we're doing blended learning. We often put a lot of text and then expect students to flow through, maybe do some questions at the beginning or the end. But there's, uh, there's not often that we really strategically place um, points of feedback and it's quite difficult to embed. Uh, so the, that, that one particular student said, if I did not get the feedback and if I did not know the answer, I'd just carry on with not really understanding the concept. But because it gives you the opportunity to answer and then give the feedback, it was really helpful. So that, that sort of um, prompt to keep moving. So one of the important questions that Mamoon explored um, was to challenge students in exploring things, trigger them to go and, and interact with some of the simulations or um, check their thinking, were what we call cognitive conflict questions. And so he, these, there's two examples there. They, they tended to be based in uh, macroscopic observations, things around us, and then explaining what was going on at the molecular level. 
So there's an example there of how can water move from pools and rivers into the clouds, explain the processes at the molecular level. Um, the second example is on a cold day, when you grab a metal box with your bare hands, it feels cold. When you uh, hold a second box, which is made of plastic, it does not feel cold. Explain why the metal box feels colder than the plastic, plastic box. I should say, at this point, the two modules, one was on um, phase change, and the other one was on heat and energy, so that they have a focus of these questions related to the two modules that he was looking at. Um, so in interviews, um, we could categorize, there was 30 students involved in this study. And so the, these questions were very useful, and they, um, they're, but these are particularly good at getting students to actually probe a little more deeply, think a little bit longer, uh, spend a little more time with whatever the uh, activity was that was on the screen in front of them. Um, so particularly, as it says there, that the most, um, the, the strongest thing was the dissatisfaction or awareness which it caused uh, um, to prompt the investigation. So not understanding what the explanation might mean, be or the meaning of, of what they were thinking about was made them go a little bit deeper. So um, that, that encouraged us. Uh, but it also raised the issue for several students of what they were seeing and what they thought they were seeing from the representations that we were placing in these um, um, environments. So we, we tend again as instructors, and many of us are time poor, we, we do that idea of our own internal idea of what we think we want to represent. We grab something or we go to something we know and we pull it into a learning environment and, and with the intention of that, that will help the students um, if they see those particles moving around and they transition from liquid to gas phase, for example, with a simulation um, where you increase temperature and so on and so forth. We have an idea of what the intent of that is, but what we find is that students don't always notice that or they, they're um, Existing knowledge doesn't enable to engage with it properly. So that idea of representational competence started to come out quite strongly through designing for online learning because of what we put in front of students as representations. So at that point, I'm going to pause. <laughs> um, that's my son's photograph of a wombat. He worked at a koala sanctuary for a while, and he's also a photographer. So. Michael. Hello. So uh, it's gone quiet out there. I think Michael's a ghost. He has, maybe he's popped out. I'll, I'll see if I can look at a couple of the questions here and answer them. <laughs> um, I'm looking at the thread. Let me have a look. So, um, P O E E, uh, someone's answered that already. So, evaluate, which is the feedback reflection piece. Um, what are effective ways to ensure students have enough prior knowledge to appropriately understand the representations, the online learning activities? Well, we try, we try and do that by doing the concept questions before they go into the online modules. So we try and give them feedback about where their thinking is and that what they should start to do. Um, it's very difficult because um, one of the issues is if students don't know what they don't know, they don't know where to start to address it. Um, so that feedback is, is where we try and do that, but we've still got some development to do on that. Um, so, so, oh, sorry, you're there. It's the first time I've ever been kicked out myself, so apologies for that. Um, <laughs> so there were, I'm guessing were you answering the question there from the I biology? Was trying. About, yes, thank you. Yes. Yes. So, um, <laughs> so yeah, this, this issue, and I think Madeline was picking was following it up then with a question around um, the issue about prior knowledge, but then when students are working on this, mm. what, what drives yeah. students to really interact with these? In other words, yeah. students look at these animations, whatever, but what pushes them to really start probing them? Yeah, no, so we do find, and um, I see good students go deeper. Yes, the students with the um, higher level of prior learning tend to be 
more willing to go a bit deeper and explore in a more open way. So they'll pr probe the dynamic in simulations where they can change things. Um, for example, the effect gases module where they can change temperature, pressure, um, uh, volume and so on and so forth. That they're quite happy to actually test their thinking and they they do talk about that in the interviews of why they chose to do that. Um, the students and, and with less... Sure. Sorry, I was, I was just going to ask, is that a result? I mean, do you, do you prompt that? Do, do, you, do your activities prompt that? Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we try to. Um, yeah. The thing, the one thing that um, and I, I, I didn't probably mention is the cognitive conflict questions actually get it, most students to do a little bit yeah. deeper thinking because they're, they're trying to understand uh, or, uh, or submit the explanation. We do ask them to type explanations into the field um, and that having to commit an answer to a box um, it seems to make them uh, try a little harder, um, but many will, especially if it's a video or um, a, a simple interactive um, object in there, they will kind of skip through it. Yeah. I had a sort of a more uh, practical question, I guess. At the start, you mentioned this idea that you had a sort of simple form of feedback model where mm. there were quizzes or whatever, uh, yes. and it was going well. And then you know, when magic kicked in and you decided to shift it to the next level. I mean, m most departments, I think, will be at the first stage. So h how does that advancement to the second stage happen? I mean, that's the bit I think <laughs> I want to know about. Yeah, I mean, how, how do how is, yeah. is it just a case of saying, no, no, we can do better here? Or, I mean, what, were you getting something back from students? Or how, how did that yeah. process happen in practice? So they, they were kind of almost in parallel. Um, the simple model worked. It was the easiest to implement in a course, and it was effective and good engagement. We still had, um, say, 60 to 70 percent of students engaging with the activities at the end of semester without marks associated with it. Obviously, you put marks in, and everybody will have a go. Um, but we wanted uh, the, the marks were in the quiz. So the driving force yeah. is that the students perceive that they need to um, understand the concepts to embark on the quiz in the first place. Um, we, we just felt that um, there were students, and again, it's this inclusive practice. There were students who were not, it was the weaker students who wouldn't necessarily persist with those modules, and they were the ones that also would start dropping from doing the quizzes later in the semester. So we wanted to try and find better ways to um, engage all the different students, whether it was with and without chemistry, in exploring. So we needed to know what were the um, best combinations of um, representations and activities, or uh, which we haven't got an answer for yet because everything raised more questions, um, or what prompts and um, what feedback works well, because it is difficult to give individual feedback to students. Um, and another question uh, before we go back to the presentation, you, you've alluded to a few times this effective aspect, this motivation mm. or engagement and so on. Yeah. Are, are you drawing on a the frameworks you mentioned at the start, are they informing that or are you drawing on a framework that's sort of considering these effective and motivational aspects? Yeah, no, we, um, when we did the um, LIPO evaluation of the original implementation, which was over a two year period, and actually Madeline was involved in a bigger project around that, it was part of that um, at a couple of universities. We did um, the Motivated Strategies for Learning questionnaire as well at the end of semester okay. to try and get insights into um, with lots of open questions on, on self-regulation, whether there's effective properties, uh, confidence and all that sort of thing, um, fed into the way students had engaged, their self-reported engagement with things during the course. Um, and there was there's lots of outcomes, a whole other story, there was lots of outcomes. The simplest one that can come to mind is that um, students who had high scores in self-regulated learning questions, um, when you ask them where they would go to understand a concept more deeply, would talk about the um, lecture notes or the textbook, whereas students who had um, low self-regulation scores um, reported that they Google. <laughs> right. So, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, it was the path of yeah. least resistance. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It, it's interesting. It ties into a lot of what Scott Lewis was talking about before as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I, I will stop talking and pass back over to you for the second half. Um, okay. Thank you. 
So, um, so that's the big picture, and that's the work we do, kind of looking at a whole class and trying to to do instructional design for a course, which which kind of is inclusive, or we can try and engage students in, in their thinking a little bit more. But uh, lots of questions came out of that that started to get us thinking about what type of representations that we were using and how could we use these in, in better ways. So I'm going back to that diagram I had at the start, um, which kind of balances the idea of all the different forms of external representation. And you'll notice that animation simulation experiment or demos, or gestures embodiment, which are what the teachers tend to emphasize with their clickers or their arms or balloons or whatever in class. Um, these are all things that we, we, we probably want to try and find out what's good for an online environment. Because uh, if it is the teacher explanation and the gestures are really important, then a video of the lecturer for short video of the lecture for key concepts may be appropriate and so on and so forth. Um, so th there was also evidence of the students not noticing important features in representations, especially those dynamic ones. So sorry, I should also notice those italicized ones are the dynamic um, and interactive types of representations. So uh, coming back to the idea of work that's been done by Ari and Linda, they talk about the critical constellation of modes. Um, or the disciplinary ways of knowing. This came out of physics originally, and, and, and people may be aware of it, but I think it's actually really relevant. Um, the idea that teachers, the way they explain things, so their presence um, is critical because they kind of model the linking or the ways that representations are used to, to construct or to test concepts. And that's something that's really difficult to capture in online environments. And I know a fair amount of work has been done in that area. Uh, so, but that idea of what are the representations um, started to be more important to us. And so, we, um, I had a, a postdoc, Joao, from um, Amazonia, from Brazil, a couple of years ago. And this postdoc project, um, people may have seen this work before, um, that we reported, uh, it's currently submitted for publication. Um, we, we basically said, well, okay, what are lecturers doing? So if we've got these online modules and we want these to substitute um, or be complemented by blended online activities, so what pieces are important? Therefore, what have we been putting in front of students in traditional classes? And how can we choose representations that may improve access for students and perhaps learning disabilities uh, and so on and so forth? So, uh, what we did was we categorized all the representations that were in a set of lecture slides for one semester using three frameworks, so Johnston's Levels of Chemistry Thinking, Gilbert's Modes of um, Representation in Science, and Sharon Ainsworth's um, ta Functional Taxonomy for how representations are combined together on a single slide. So the way the teacher had brought things together with the intention of, of teaching a concept. Um, now, this work is, is all summarized in one very dense slide, and I apologize for that. Um, again, if people are interested, they can um, talk to me later um, offline about it. But basically, the take home messages came out um, through hierarchical cluster analysis. We found five clusters of representations that were related, were, were related by topic. And, and not just they didn't automatically all cluster together, so all the thermo topics didn't necessarily all just jump together. The clusters actually were linked by relationships in terms of the representations using those three frameworks. Um, there were 3,367 different representations um, across the slides um, in 13 weeks worth of lectures, so there's three lectures a week, so that's an awful lot of representations for students to process. Them. Um, and what we found was we also asked students about the representations that they valued uh, at the end of semester. So um, a lot of this aligns with what's been reported in the literature already. So we found that the majority of representations were symbolic. So teachers like to teach with equations and um, calculations and, and those sorts of representations, um, electrons and things and arrows, all those sorts of representations. And when there were sub-micro and macro representations in terms of the levels of thinking, um, they were always linked to some form of symbolic representation in the slides. There were very few uh, macroscopic representations in the slides, but what we acknowledge is that there were demonstrations done. They weren't captured as a demonstration in the slides. It was a photograph of the demonstration to prompt the lecturer. Um, 
Uh, and that that has also been reported in literature. There was a call for um, for, uh, for chemistry teachers to use more um, macroscopic representations several years ago. Um, so the topics of equilibrium solutions thermodynamics were mainly supported through chemical, mathematical, and symbolic explanations, um, and that doesn't surprise us. That was the biggest cluster in the um, analysis they came together. Um, and those are sorts of things that you can convert into online um, resources quite easily. The sub-micro representations were concentrated in the two topics of um, VSEPR and hybridization, and that shouldn't surprise us because we draw lots of, uh, we use lots of images from textbooks or hand-drawn or whatever of um, orbitals in those, and where atoms are arranged in 3D in those particular topics. Student feedback, however, was quite interesting because what they pointed out was actually across the course, they valued the verbal um, explanation. So reinforcing the idea that we got from the um, online blended um, environments, they wanted the lecture explanations, particularly of how to use symbols and the features in the representations that they were noticing. So that modeling of thinking, the discourse of the discipline came through as being important. And they were particularly fond of when the lecturers hand drew representations on visualizers. Um, and one that was cited was electrochemical cells. So um, I know from my, I teach that particular topic myself. Uh, students find it very difficult to assign anodes and electrodes and join things up and have the directions of electron flow. So having an electro draw it and explain as they're doing it um, after the students have attempted it, that was things, the sort of thing they, they reported valuing. Also, again, in VSEPR, they um, really valued when the lecturers brought in the physical models. So uh, these are all things that don't automatically translate into online environments. We have to think a little bit more deeply about how to do that. And that's something that we're aiming to do. So this comes um, down to that idea, again, still going on the theme of what we're putting in front of students for learning. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, especially when we want want them to learn on their own, so without the teacher guidance, which is often the case, um, we have to think very carefully about the, the language, the symbolism, and the way that the surface features that, that we're, we're noticing or using and combining in representations to make meaning of concepts. Um, and and Wunshar noted that expert chemistry involves thinking with visual-spatial skills, and we could see that coming out of some of the analysis already, uh, recognizing graphic conventions, manipulating things in 3Ds. Most of us, will, when we think about something, whether it's a solution in ions dissolved, or whether it's molecules interacting with intermolecular forces, we tend to pick them up in our mental models in our head because we're expert thinkers, and they're dynamic, and they're moving and rotating. Um, and Students who haven't got very well-developed mental models tend to focus on surface features rather than that more uh, spatial um, mental model with moving things. So um, this is something that we became more became more important to us to try and develop resources that might promote those skills. And so we really representational competence. So. We, um, the last year or so, we've, been, we've started to do more work in looking at what we can translate into online resources based on the analysis of the lectures, what things come together really well. And uh, we, we found that the learning, as it says here, that it's very important that learning supported through noticing or discerning something in a representation and reasoning about it in a meaningful way. Um, and that's what we want to try and get students to stop and think about. Now, I noticed a typo in this slide earlier. So on these dot points, um, Cook's work says that um, learners with higher levels of prior chemistry knowledge um, notice uh, conceptually relevant features. Um, and it should say lower levels in the second dot point. I apologize for that. So surface features are what the learners with lower level of prior chemistry knowledge uh, notice. And that ties back to what we were finding through Mamoun's work um, in the online modules. So then that, that means that we have to focus more on, as teachers, using ways to model or help students notice features and link to their level of understanding or to improve their level of understanding to be able to engage with representations that are maybe a little bit more complex. And this is particularly important from when the students are moving between 2D and 3D representations. And that, to be honest, is where a lot of the resources um, are 
um, or, or the construction of the online resources are heading these days. So they're, they're showing things in sub-micro representations that are three-dimensional and students need to be able to visually, spatially um, move those and think about what the meaning of all the features are uh, as they uh, interact with them. So this is particularly important. <coughs> so, sorry, I'm losing my voice. This is terrible. <coughs> Excuse me one minute. I have some water. So um, I had an um, undergraduate research student um, in 2017 who started to, to look at converting models from textbook 2D images um, into uh, tactile models and 3D models and probe what students were noticing um, and whether, you know, if, if we get students to build their own models, for example, there's a lot of literature to say that the actual construction of models really supports students' understanding um, of the arrangement or the features of, of the sub-micro representation that they're trying to, um, to build or to, to put together. And so she started to think about this in terms of uh, representational competence, and there's a lot of literature about that as well. But we, we were informed um, by Martina Rao's recent work, which talks about visual understanding and fluency and connectional understanding and fluency. So the idea that students can link the representations to a concept, um, that they can connect different representations with each other, um, and then also communicate um, using representations uh, is a basic sort of overarching uh, summary of those sorts of ideas. And so it was interesting because the textbook images on the left are three different textbook representations of um, ethene. And what we see is that um, it's got go faster stripes on one. That's the only thing I think I can explain those as. Um, there's bulgy balloons. And of course, as expert thinkers the, and teachers, we can instantly look at those and think that we know what that's being conveyed. But the students didn't automatically um, really interpret them that way. And we've, I've put one little quote up there from some of the interviews it says, um, I can tell these are hydrogens. I guess this is the pi bond, but I don't know what those yellow bulgy things are, which are the hybrid orbitals. Um, however, they did find engaging with the 3D online model, being able to move it around spatially to actually gain insight into what was in the middle, so the hybrid orbitals, um, and then actually try and build one um, did support uh, their, their thinking. So that it was, it was evident that moving between 2D and 3D representations um, had provided some small assistance. And that was just a small study. So Paris actually came back and continued um, and did honours with me um, in Australia. We have a one-year undergrad uh, research project that students can do before they do postgraduate study, which is honours research. And this time she focused on um, VSEPR, or VESPA as people here like to call it. Uh, and we focused on the, um, where there was a central atom and five satellite atoms, and then increasing numbers of lone pairs. Because uh, one of the things that we found um, was that students didn't handle the representations or the spatial arrangement of lone pairs of electrons very well in this learning um, these types of, of representations. Uh, and there's a fair amount of research about that too. But our, from our perspective, we, we're not trying to re rediscover what's already known. We're actually trying to develop new resources to support students learning with this online. So it, it's very much from a practice-based perspective. And I'm just noticing time, so I shall try and speed up a little bit. Um, so what she, so, sorry, um, oops, now I've gone hurtling through. So she did interviews, um, engaged students um, in different representations, asked them to explain their thinking. They built a model through a molecular model kit, and then they interacted with a 3D model. Now, we, we asked the first question, draw the low structure of PCL5, and there were several molecules. This is just a snapshot. Um, and to put the baseline in place, and these are students that have completed the course, so it's at the end of the semester, and they've all been taught the same um, content about BSCPR and Lewis structures. And the question actually became, we didn't have a baseline because there were so many ways that students could draw fluid <laughs> structures of uh, different molecules. <laughs> um, so these are some of the um, ones that we, uh, we could see. Um, we have Lewis structures where, um, kind of along the lines, of the lecture slide that they encounter is on the left. And you can see there's some wedge and dash bonding. Um, so I'll use this pointer. So you can see the, the um, three-dimensional spatial sort of features coming into that particular drawing. Here they've just done the Lewis structure. 
Um, it's not incorrect in terms of a Lewis structure, but it's not correct in terms of a shape. Um, however, these were students that had a range of achievement in the mid-semester exam that tested them. And what we found is that um, the, their achievement in the exam didn't predict their ability to draw these structures. And here are some of the more um, flawed representations. So here we have um, the use of the symbolic um, solid wedge bond um, not used correctly. Um, there's lots of different things. They're not sure really to how to convey this, but also it's kind of like a square base and a um, vertical chlorine on that one. Um, here we have electrons just scattered. Um, the explanation by the student, they were trying to work out where they should go and they didn't ha really have an idea of going its electrons. And this is the strangest one of all. And I'm just going to follow on with that a little bit more. Um, but it, it, there's no sense of um, shape or a little structure in that particular representation. What we did find though, and this is often the case when you do research with students, the process of doing the interview actually influences the students' thinking as they go through the interview. And I think that, that that's okay in itself because it gives you insights into what they're doing and how they're thinking and what they're engaging with and how that's affecting their thinking um, rather than just purely snapshotting uh, a state of a mental model and so on. So that particular student that drew that last um, structure, which is up here in the top left hand corner, um, this is um, the student's explanation when they started to draw the structure. So, oh, okay, so PCL5, you've got probably the P in the middle, I'm guessing, um, and then you're going to have five CLs, uh, that's four, that's all right, we'll make it five. Um, phosphorus is one, two, three, four, back, so it has one, two, three, four, and they draw small circles between P and the phosphorus and four of the chlorines. Then they question themselves, maybe, I'm unsure. Chlorine needs one more to get it to that spot and draw small circles. So they're kind of trying to move their way through a loose structure. Um, so they share, right? So they've got curved lines connecting the circles for sharing. So the student hasn't either the language or the representational competence really in terms of drawing Lewis structures here. And they recognize this. So they start to say, and I don't know what to do with him, the last chlorine, which has been given no electrons. So I'm just going to do one of these boys. And they just add a dash bond at the side. And they know instantly it's wrong. They're right, and then it's wrong. I'm quite aware that it's wrong. And then the students seem to have this fascination with drawing tetrahedral structures for everything. So they, he's, uh, they, um, drew this structure at the side, trying to do the 3D shape and um, start to try and think of the, the name, so the kind of square base pyramid. Um, and then when they see the uh, textbook representation, they start to bring out some more names that they've come across during the course, a bipolar pyramid or something. Uh, probably not a sawhorse, no, no, it's not. Um, when they encountered the 3D model and were able to interact with it, and also the 3D model has annotations, so this is the FET molecular shape model, um, and it, it's really quite mobile. They were very um, taken with it, so, it, so it's trigonal by pyramid. Um, you can rotate it, which I guess is just cool. I feel like the way that it moves is similar to how a molecule would move in real life if one of these chlorines just started rotating all over the place. Um, they kind of look for a way to be as far as they look. They kind of look for a way to be as far away from as possible, which is really kind of cool. Um, and then they talk about the bond angles and so on. So, so they, they've kind of learned through interacting with that 3D model, and, it, and they've seen the terminology. So that that competence in terms of not just what they're looking at, but the language that goes with it is something that builds back to Martina Rao's framework in terms of fluency versus understanding. So uh, there's a lot more of this, uh, those interviews. We're, we're processing them to um, kind of um, to, to get uh, lots of information. There's so much rich information coming out of these interviews. Actually, this is my table's corrupted here. Um, I apologize for that. This should all be in a table. Um, basically, this is just a quick summary um, of all the different things that helped lower achieving students who had um, alternate conceptions. So the table's not helping them structure this, but just if you read across each line, so students that had problems distinguishing between an electron and electronic and um, molecular geometry, the virtual model was very helpful. Um, lots of things helped determine the placement of the lone pairs in the interviews. Um, the names of the geometries and the effects of lone pairs on bond angles were strongly influenced by the virtual model. 
Um, and the difficulties in visualizing 3D and translating uh, between 2D and 3D representations were also assisted by the tactile physical model. So there's a role for all these different types of representations. And what we're trying to do now is think of ways to build these into the online modules. And, and we're encouraging students to build models much more. And I just want to kind of finish, because I'm conscious of time, Michael, sorry for this, um, by jumping through. I'm going to skip that one. That's just another example. It's just one slide of where we tried to, to build in progressions. So I apologize for skipping that, but I think it's more important just to jump to this last piece. This is um, where we tried to build this back into practice and instructions. And, and what we did is we used in an online blended module, so the students are doing this outside the classroom, we asked them to identify the um, molecule that had the incorrect representation of its shape, then draw the correct shape on a padlet, which is a, a, a whiteboard capture um, application. Uh, we got um, incorrect representations, we got correct representations, but what we also got was more insight that students are still not aware of the formalisms and the meanings of the representations they're drawing. And it was really interesting because um, an enormous number of students, 50% of the 1,100 students, um, drew this structure um, on, and uploaded it where they had the lone pairs at the end of the representations for the geometry of bonds. Now, actually, when you go to the web, you actually see that. And they've decided, and we haven't done any work on this, but this is just capturing what the students are doing. It's giving us more questions to look at. Um, the students have chosen that representation as the best representation for the answer to this problem. Um, and then you have some where they've just drawn these um, uh, bonds to show shape. Anyway, at that point, I think I should stop. Um, I'm sorry for running over. I just want to say that teaching is getting a bit like this. We have this array of things we have to put together. Um, acknowledge people and thank you. Sorry. <laughs> thank you very much. Greg. You know, the scope of that presentation is just amazing. Um, in the concept of time, so I'll get straight to some questions. I have notes here. Um, when you were talking about representations, uh, there was a question about examples of representations, but I think um, maybe you could share some of those afterwards. I can put them on the website, yeah. but you're talking about things like Lewis structures. Um, yeah. Representations of two dimensional structures and two, two dimensions and that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 No, the representations encompass everything. If you go to that sort of um, chart with the, the, the all the list of things in the middle, it can be anything from verbal representations to pictures to photographs. Um, but a representation is just what we put into external space as our. Um, what we see a concept to be. So how we present yeah. that is in different modes. Well, I mean, one interesting point that perhaps is, needs a longer discussion is the, the impact of virtual reality coming in stream and, and whether that's something that's going to impact this kind of student understanding, but also whether that's something that could be useful in an online environment. I think so. Actually, I remember a few years ago seeing a presentation where somebody was doing intermolecular forces through haptics. So they were a psychologist. And they had students putting some sort of gloves on and, and moving molecules close to each other. And they could feel the relative strength. Wow. So that, that, that the interactive thing, that, well, that was really impressive. I think that's it, that, that will have more of a role. Um, um, Madeline version two, can you believe there's two versions of Madeline, uh, was asking questions. One was interesting, I suppose, this, this idea of um, watching a video and then watching something face to face. I mean, is this kind of comes back to, the, I suppose, the core question about online learning and online resources. Do you have any sense from your work about whether one has it is advantageous or? Um, so I can tell you that our students tell us um, quite frequently that they prefer to hear um, their own lecturers explain things. So anything that involves narration or um, uh, sort of explanations that are verbal, um, the students want their own academics from their own institution doing that. And I think that's because that's that idea. When you ask students, do you prefer to learn online or come face to face? Um, large numbers of them say they want to come face to face because they want to hear the lecturer explain it. Or, And I think there's a little bit of a driving force because the lecturer sets the exam. So it's more that sort of, well, this is going to become relevant. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, I guess there's a, something in there about the online and that it's a chance for students to check back or 
interrogate in their own time or something like that? Oh, yeah, no, they can go. I mean, all of these things are available all semester, so that, that's that's true. Yeah. All right, Gwen, we are unfortunately out of time, but thank you Sorry. very much for no, this fantastic, amazing presentation, such a broad range of um, in, inputs in terms of the kind of frameworks you're building on, but also I, you know, your work is informing practice, and that's what's so um, fantastic about it. Thank you for dealing with firearms, website crashes, everything <laughs> else, and keeping a very smooth presentation on, on, on the road. So um, the audience are virtually clapping all around the world. So um, we will um, sign off by saying thank you. I will stop recording this.